Welcome. My name is Dong Lei Yu. I'm going to present a poster, Evaluation of Elemental Impurities in Drug Substances. The authors of this poster are myself, Dr. Actor, Dr. Liu, and Dr. Randad. We work in the Division of Life Cycle API within the Office of New Drug Product. Beginning from late 2017 and early 2018, FDA sent ODMF holders a general comment and asked them to submit a risk assessment for elemental impurities in DMF submission. In this poster, we will be discussing how to evaluate the elemental impurities in drug substances. The elemental impurities pose toxicological concerns because they do not provide any therapeutic benefit to the patient. The levels of elemental impurities in a drug product should be controlled within acceptable limits. The drug substance is one of the components in a drug product and a major source of elemental impurities. FDA requires DMF holders to provide risk assessment of elemental impurities for the manufacturing process of drug substances. The purpose of this poster is to discuss the risk assessment of elemental impurities, including catalysts and environmental contaminants that may present in a drug substance. The ICHQ3D guideline for elemental impurities gives recommendations for the manufacturers of human drugs and biologics on applying a risk-based approach to control elemental impurities and the permitted daily exposures. USP General Chapter 232 Elemental Impurities Limits became official on January 1, 2018. This chapter contains the limits of elemental impurities. Chapter 233 has recommendations on the test procedures. The 24 elements included in the ICHQ3D have been placed into three classes based on their toxicity and the likelihood of occurrence in the drug product. The class 1 elements, including arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead, are human toxicants that have limited or no use in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals. Because of their unique nature, these four elements require evaluation during the risk assessment across all potential sources and routes of administration. The class two elements are generally considered as root-dependent human toxicants. They are further divided into subclasses 2A and 2B based on their relative likelihood of occurrence in the drug product. Cobalt, nickel, and vanadium belong to class 2A elements. They have a relatively high probability of occurrence in the drug product, and thus require risk assessment in all routes of administration. The 10 elements in class 2B have a reduced probability of occurrence in the drug product related to their low abundance and the low potential to be co-isolated with other materials. They may be excluded from the risk assessment unless they are intentionally added during the manufacture of drug substances, excipients, or other components of the drug product. The seven elements in class three have relatively low toxic toxicities by the oral route, 
but may require consideration in the risk assessment for inhalation and the parenteral routes of administration. SHQ3D provides methods to assess elemental impurities in a drug product. The following methods can also be used in the risk assessment of a drug substance. The Table 5.1 includes 24 elements which should be considered in the risk assessment. The Table 8.2.1 lists the PDEs for each element under oral, parenteral, and inhalation routes of administration. Section 7 on page 15 talks about converting the PDEs to concentration limits using the for this formula. Q3D provides several options. Option 1 is a simplified approach to this calculation. It uses 10 grams per day as daily amount of a drug product. Usually, when we evaluate the elemental impurities in a drug substance, we use option 1. However, if the maximum daily dose or MDD of a drug substance is higher than 10 grams a day, we recommend the DMF holder to use the MDD instead of the daily amount in the above calculation. The elemental impurities are detectable by inductively coupled plasma, or ICP. The procedures are given in USP General Chapter 233. The recommended analytical procedures are ICP-OES or ICP-MAS. The MESER details, MESER LOD, LOQ, and the batch data should be reported. SHQ3D suggests a control threshold at a limit of 30% of established PDE of the elemental impurity. Therefore, the method LOQ should be no more than 30% of the limit. When should an element be controlled in a drug substance specification? If the level of an element is higher than 30% of the limit in the batch data, this element should be controlled. In this example, we will talk about how to perform the risk assessment of elemental impurities in a DMF and what to do if the MDD is higher than 10 grams per day. The drug product is ampicillin for injection. The drug substance is ampicillin sodium. The MDD is 12 grams per day of ampicillin, which equals to 12.75 gram per, grams per day of ampicillin sodium. The route of administration is injection. And there are no intentionally added elements. The drug product is for injection. In the risk assessment, we need to use the parenteral PDEs. From Q3D Table 5.1, the four class 1 elements, three class 2A elements, and three class 3 elements should be included in the risk assessment. The parenteral PDEs for these elements can be found in Table A21. Now, we use this formula to calculate the limit. Since the MDD of ampicillin is higher than 10 grams per day, we use the MDD of ampicillin sodium at 12.75 grams per day in this formula. This is how we get the limit for these elements. In the previous slides, we talked about how to perform risk assessment following ICHQ3D. In 95% or more cases, DMFs can directly use the element and methods in ICHQ3D. Next, 
we are going to discuss the elemental impurities not covered by SHQ3D. Q3D indicates that the PDEs of some elemental impurities have not been established due to their low inherent toxicity or differences in regional regulations that are not addressed in this guideline. For example, aluminum for compromised renal function, manganese and zinc for patients with compromised hepatic function. Some atypical drug substances from mind sources, excipients, food additives, or cosmetic ingredients registered as drug substances, such as lanthanum carbonate, potassium chloride, etc. Regarding to the catalysts not included in SHQ3D, this guideline has included most catalysts used in the pharmaceutical industry. If a drug substance uses a catalyst not listed in ICHQ3D, this element needs to be evaluated since it is intentionally added. When there are elements not included in the ICHQ3D, how do we control the elemental impurities? It's case by case. However, the general principles in ICHQ3D still apply. The PDEs of the elemental impurities should be derived on case by case basis following the method described in ICHQ3D Appendix 1. Similar to related substances, the proposed limits can be justified if the limit do not exceed the levels observed in ROD batches. Alternatively, the proposed limits can be justified by comprehensive summary of scientific literature or farm tax studies. Example 2 is a drug substance with elemental impurities not covered by SHQ3D. The drug product, lanthanum, chewable, lanthanum carbonate chewable tablet. The drug substance is lanthanum carbonate. The MDD is 3 grams per day as element lanthanum and around 6 grams per day as lanthanum carbonate pentahydrate. The lanthanum carbonate is a phosphate bender indicated to reduce serum phosphate in patients with end-stage renal disease. Lanthanum is the active drug. Therefore, the elemental impurities should be treated like related substances and routinely controlled in the drug substance specifications. We have the following suggestions. First, the 24 elements in ICHQ3D should be controlled. Lanthanum belongs to the rare earth elements. Due to the similarity in ionic radius between adjacent lanthanides, it is difficult to separate them from each other in naturally occurring ores and other mixtures. These lanthanides should be controlled. Besides the elements I just mentioned, all possible elemental impurities should be controlled in study material or drug substance specifications. The proposed limits should not exceed the levels observed in ROD batches or justified with scientific literature or toxicity studies. The omission of an element can be justified by test results. The method details and the validation reports should be provided. The method should be sensitive. The limit of quantitation should be less than 30% of proposed limit. The study material is lanthanum oxide. The geographic location of the ore should be provided. If the study material source or ore location changes, 
all possible impurities in the study material batches should be tested. In this poster, we talk about how to perform the risk assessment for elemental impurities covered by SHQ3D, as well as other elemental impurities outside SHQ3D. We also discuss the control strategy for elemental impurities in a drug substance. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions about this poster, please send your questions to the above email by February 15th for inclusion in the poster Q&A session of March 4th.